Hey, this is Rick from SolarIMG.org with a very special guest today on our podcast. We have Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, and uh, he served as a mission specialist on STS-100 um, and installed a cannon arm, and he loves scuba diving, and he's a flyboy, and uh, uh, one of my personal heroes, so it's, it's a pleasure to have him on. Uh, we're going to talk to him a little bit right now. Do, do we have you, sir? Oh, hello, sir. Uh, thank you. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Rick, sorry it took me a minute to ring in. I was I was just finishing with another interview. Oh, that's okay. Thanks. I hear you're rather busy these days. Well, I'm always very busy. It, it seems to be part of the job, but it's a part that I like. Cool. Well, I connected with, uh, with you initially through our, our mutual friend, Camilla, who's the SDO mascot, and you and the EPOs and the communications teams and everybody else have been very successful using social media to connect and engage people from all around the world and keep everyone up to date on, on your mission. Uh, what are some of the cooler things you're doing uh, for the launch? Well, let's see. Um, today I was inside the uh, orbiter processing facility, the big barn where we take a shuttle that has just landed from space and turn it around and get it ready to launch today. It takes about two months minimum to do that, and I was in with Endeavour today, right uh, just right up next to Endeavour, the last spaceship that I rode to space, and like watching her getting ready because just in a few weeks they'll be taking her out to the pad to get ready for her launch in April. So pretty nice to be uh, that close to, to a spaceship, uh, especially one that I've had a, a chance to ride in. Well, I know that the, you're getting the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer onto the International Space Station that you're commanding. Um, can you tell us more about what it does? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I actually had a chance to go to Geneva, to the big uh, particle accelerator to CERN, and work with uh, Nobel laureate Dr. Sam Ting on that, um, amazingly enough. It, it's, of course, the fundamental purpose of it is to try and understand what the universe is made of. Uh, we know when we when we look through telescopes what we can see, and we know what the various things that we see, the effect they seem to have on each other. But when you start doing the math as to how everything affects each other and how gravity ought to work, it, it sure seems like there's something out there heavy that's missing. Mm-hmm. And the, the universe just doesn't um, make complete sense to us yeah. naturally, of course, because we're just new to it and trying to figure it out. But what we're hoping to do is once you get above the atmosphere, then of course you're much more in the wind of the universe. You're not protected by nearly as much by the Earth's atmosphere. And so, by mounting a um, by mounting a, a collector, a, a magnetic, a huge magnet on top of the space station, for years we can use the electrical power of the space station uh, to power this research center, this uh, this collector up on top. That will um, that will then gather bits of the universe, gather the particles that are sent out from the other suns of the universe, and uh, and try and better understand what the universe is made of. And the alpha magnetic spectrometer, what a great combination to be able to lift it on a vehicle like the shuttle, to be able to mount it on a, on a laboratory like the space station, and take advantage of, of all those things that we've worked so many decades for, to then try and better understand the universe around us. I think it's, it's just uh, exactly what we should be doing. Well, um, before the events, uh, before the earthquakes in uh, New Zealand and a couple other places, there was a a massive jump, a massive ionospheric uh, electron anomaly, and we're also seeing changes uh, with the magnetometers in the magnetic field during these events. So will will this be able to lead to maybe some detection capabilities and stuff like that? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not a a particle physicist. I'm I'm not sure exactly. (laughs) What other, what other areas we'll be using it for, uh, it would make sense to me that if the flux, I mean, it's going to go around the world and it will be pointed radially outwards from the world. So during the time of day that, that the radiation from the sun is vertically above the station, it will be collecting data from our sun as to whether that will help. I mean, we have a lot of satellites up right now specifically to stare at our own sun and understand the health of, you know, living with a star type satellites, so I'm not sure how much it'll add to those. I don't know. Um, well, you've been in space, so you're probably a really good person to speak with about this, is uh, the effects of space and geomagnetic storms and particles and, and whatnot on the body. There's changes to the heart rate and, and et cetera. Um, but how did it affect you as a person? How did it affect your dreams? Um, well, we there are all sorts of different um, uh, 
changes to the physical environment by being up there. The biggest, the most obvious is the absence of gravity, of course. That, that is the most obvious and fundamental difference of being up there. Um, and that changes things as much as anything. You have no up or down. When you come into a room, there's no floor, there's no ceiling, and you can completely um, rethink a room when, when you can just picture any of the planes as the floor or the ceiling. And so you tend to view spaces differently. And, and it seems bizarre when you come back to the world and everyone is stuck to the floor. It just seems silly. <laughs> we have these yeah. beautiful rooms all with three-meter ceilings, and everyone always stays on the floor. It just, it just seems a horrific waste of space when you've been so free as to be in, in weightlessness. But of course, the other enormous changes are the speed with which you're going around the world so that every time you look out the window, there's another entire continent racing by at eight kilometers a second. And that changes your perspective. To be able to go around the world in 90 minutes, to be able to go around the world so fast that you see uh, 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day, that really helps to put our world into a little different perspective. And also, when you close your eyes in space, if you wait a little while, those same particles that we are going to be uh, collecting and detecting with the alpha magnetic spectrometer, some of them actually randomly go through your optic nerve and you see them as flashes. And, and so you can actually see the energy of the universe, the increased radiation of living in orbit with your own uh, vision sensing system. And that, that makes you think about where you are in the universe as well. So, so it's, an, it's an overwhelmingly different place to be and it attacks almost all the senses. And, uh, and I found when I was out on a spacewalk, uh, inside my spacesuit, I really didn't have anything in touch or in taste or in smell or in, um, in all the normal senses. The only one that I truly could see that I was in a, comp or feel that I was in a completely different place was in uh, sight. And so I had to reconcile the basic normality of the rest of my senses with the incredible wonder of what I was seeing through my eyes. And, and when you're in space, you constantly get this weird juxtaposition of normality and complete abnormality. And, and I think that probably is, is something that you need to adapt to as much as anything else. Well, you're literally going around the world, you've been around the world, and your mission has been fundamentally a worldwide mission. And what's it been like to uh, work with different countries and see their procedures and try to make square pegs fit into round holes and such? Or, yeah, or, or square air conditioning systems fit into round containers. Um, <laughs> we, um, well, uh, the job of an astronaut is as, as sort of the main integrator of everyone's ideas because uh, a brilliant researcher somewhere in Tokyo will have come up with a great idea and he will have gone through all the hoops and got it approved and got it uh, sorted out by JAXA and then JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, their exploration agency, will have taken it and built the space hardware and then trained me to operate it in amongst the thousands of other things that I'm getting trained to operate. And so I, at some point, I will need to take everything I've learned about everything and then put them all together in orbit and make them all work so that any given day, I may be uh, looking for dark matter in the universe, I may be speaking to school children in rural Manitoba, and I may be um, uh, fixing the toilet. And, and those things will all be back to back. And, and so we are the integrators. We are the ones that have to take the, the decades of training that happens all around the world. I mean, two days ago I was in Russia, and here I am today in Florida at the Cape helping with a shuttle launch. Next week I'll be going out to California to get trained on the new commercial Dragon spacecraft. We have to take all of that avalanche of information, integrate it all together in our heads as to how it all is practically and operationally going to work together, and then make it all happen for the six months we're on station. And that, that's one of the hardest parts about the job, is keeping all of that stuff straight picking out the stuff that matters in amongst the in unlimited amount of information that, that really isn't going to matter, and, uh, and then making it all work. And that's, uh, that's what an astronaut's job is. And what experiments are you personally looking forward to the most? Um, actually, my flight is uh, a, little over, or a little under two years away, and so I have not been trained on the experiments yet. Um, I've been training on the Soyuz to learn to fly the spaceship on the space station. And um, mine is Expedition 3435. I'll be up there. I'll be the commander during Expedition 35. So 
uh, we're currently just on Expedition 26. So, of course, all of the scientific researchers and, and PhD um, and postdoc students are working very much with the next several crews. And my turn will come probably starting about a year from now to train in detail on the experiments that I'll be running up there. I trained as Bob Thirsk's backup when he flew on Expedition 20. Um, and so I trained on all of the experiments that he ran. And, and some of them actually have content on Discovery that's launching tomorrow. But whether how much uh, overlap there'll be between what I did before and what I'll do next time, I don't know yet. But what I'm really looking forward to is the human experience. Yes, we're doing worthwhile experiments up there. But at the same time, we are, as a species, leaving Earth and exploring the universe in person with our eyes and our hands. We're figuring out how to do it, how to build the hardware, how to build the crews, how to build the support, and how to build the psychological teams that can make this happen. And yes, there are experiments involved, but just being there is the magnificent experiment at the center of it. And that's the part I'm looking forward to regardless. Well, it doesn't matter if you're in a scuba suit or a plane or a spaceship. As long as you're not walking, you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I have used a lot of technology to do a lot of different things. And I count myself very lucky to have been sort of um, in the middle of all those things. You're, you're living the dream, and Canada is very happy. We're behind you, and then you know people. You know, say, say I'm going to do an interview with, with Chris Hadfield, and everybody's like, oh, why not? Really? <laughs> so um, we're really watching this, uh, and it's been a, and a tremendous success with the social media connecting just everyday people. And we're very appreciative of the work that you do with the with the equipment and connecting us because you know it's it's at the point now where it's like Star Trek. You can pull out a tricorder and pull up the sensors and see what the sun's doing or see what uh, the magnetic field's doing. So it's true really, really an amazing time to be alive. Uh, I agree. And, and the, the resource of, of ready information that is at our fingertips now is almost at the tricorder level. It's, uh, it's, I agree with you. It's a tremendously um, provocative and stimulating time to be alive. There's just so much that is readily available and, and so many things that are, that are now within the human experience. But for me, I still feel the same excitement now that I did when I was nine years old, when I thought, first thought that maybe it might be possible for a, a Canadian kid like me to have an experience like flying in space. Well, now I've, I've had a chance to do it twice, and now I'm going to command a spaceship. And, and that same raw, uh, unbelievable excitement that this, about this new human experience, it's still very much in my heart every day. And, uh, and I, I just I count my lucky stars that, that I am in a country and in a time that this is possible. It's amazing. It, it really is. And, and, and it, it's just the discoveries being made daily, the hard work and um, astronauts and, and field personnel don't get highlighted as much. Sure. Um, so yeah, those, those field personnel are crucial, and they're the key. They're the backbone. So I want to give big ups to the support personnel and the field staff and everybody toiling away at computers and stuff. Oh, um, I, I agree. I, I, I meet with them all around the world all the time, and they are they are – absolutely the pyramid by which we can get to the very peak and and so so I, I listen to them they're the true experts and we are just the lucky people to get to go do this by hand okay, well I guess our time's up sir but thank you so much for speaking with us and we're going to follow your mission closely and Godspeed well thank you very much Rick it was a pleasure to speak with you and, and uh, best of luck with your website it's, it's good to see thanks I appreciate that and uh, maybe we can get you on again some other day and we can talk more I hope I can you also well, there we have it. You can find out more about what Chris is doing by going to the Canadian Space Agency website or uh, checking him out on Twitter or Facebook. You can also check out NASA Sun Earth Day and Camilla SDO. They're doing really amazing work. So check out uh, those websites and check solarimg.org uh, for updates and real-time monitoring uh, systems. Until next time, try and think of something on Earth that the sun doesn't affect. Maybe. Extreme files, gray area. Cheers. Yeah.